thank you again for making time for us. Good afternoon, Arthur. Okay, so when you hear those numbers from the report that misinformation in this country uh, cost at least 2,800 lives and $300 million in hospital expenses, what's your reaction to that? How, how surprising are those numbers? Yeah, unfortunately, it isn't surprising. I think it's very challenging to quantify this. Having said that, it's pretty clear that the burden is enormous in terms of hospitalizations, deaths, lost productivity, healthcare uh, impact as well in terms of uh, you know, s uh, scheduled surgeries being canceled. Like there's a tremendous ripple effect of, of misinformation and disinformation online. It's awful to see. And, you know, from a very personal standpoint, when you speak with, for example, healthcare providers who work in healthcare, who are on the front lines, who are seeing patients in hospital, I mean, this is, this is what we saw and we would very regularly care for people who were sick in hospital with COVID-19 infections, who had opportunities to be vaccinated and who didn't get vaccinated for a variety of reasons, many of which include uh, misinformation, disinformation campaigns that impacted their decision making. And it's an extremely challenging issue. But yeah, I think the other point too is it's very likely a, a gross underestimate because this study really looked at a nine month period of time we know we we're coming up to three years of COVID-19, and unfortunately, we're going to have many more years of this as well. Yes, and it was noted, too, that this is a conservative estimate, to your point, not only because of the time frame, but also the indirect costs that you mentioned that associated in terms of delayed elective surgeries, lost wages, etc. So a lot to consider here. You know, you touched on vaccine hesitancy as well, and the report suggests that misinformation contributed to hesitancy for 2.3 million Canadians, and I'm sure you know this, I know I probably spoke to you back in 2019, even early 2020, about vaccine hesitancy with the flu vaccine. So how much more of a problem has this become since the pandemic? Yeah, the pandemic clearly amplified and exacerbated pre-existing issues with vaccine hesitancy. And of course, we know this was a major issue before COVID-19. We had very poor community uptake of the influenza vaccine. We've had measles outbreaks in Canada uh, that are, you know, this is completely unacceptable. So we have the spread of vaccine preventable illnesses. And much of that is related, at least in Canada, because people are not getting vaccinated to, to infections that they should be. And a lot of what's driving those decisions are misinformation campaigns. Of course, there's other reasons as well, but we really have to be very focused on how people get information, ensuring that it's credible information and enabling people to make smart decisions for themselves to ensure their health and well-being, but also, of course, to ensure population health and well-being. So I guess the question is, how do we do that, especially in this digital age when we know a lot of people rely on social media for information, which can be credible, can also not be the case, and people are existing in these echo chambers. You know, we heard in Natasha's report, essentially, that it seems like it might be a credible source, and you keep hearing the same thing over and over again. You know, we heard from the psychologist there that you are more likely to start believing it. So how do you combat that? I don't have any good answers for this. I have a few high-level thoughts, and one of them is the involvement of social scientists as being an integral part of a pandemic response, behavioral scientists and social scientists. And this is extremely important for communication to different communities uh, and ensuring that we have appropriate messages. Of course, we have to be honest with our data. We have to be transparent with data. But we also have to acknowledge that social media has well-funded and well-coordinated misinformation and disinformation campaigns. This impacts not just healthcare. I mean, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in this area, but we've seen it impact many other areas as well, including uh, economic issues, political uh, elections and whatnot. And this is a much bigger problem. We need a coordinated national response to this. And of course, a much more coordinated international response to this as well. Of course, we have to respect freedom of speech. We have to respect freedom of opinion and expression of those ideas. But you cannot have overt misinformation and disinformation run amok on social media because here we have right in front of our eyes the direct impact of this loss of lives, a tremendous economic, uh, tremendous economic ramifications and a huge ripple effect.
You know, finally, I wanted to ask you, given the challenges that you outlined there and the fact that change takes time uh, when it comes to these systems that are in place, particularly in getting accurate information out, combating misinformation, if another pandemic strikes, and we still are coming out of the pandemic and who knows what the future holds, what do you think it looks like in the years ahead with the way that information is consumed right now? There will be another pandemic. It's just a matter of when that's going to be and what the infection will be. But there will be another pandemic. And I would say it's urgent to manage this issue promptly, uh, not just to prepare us for the next pandemic, but to really prepare us for what we're dealing with right now. Uh, we're not prepared for the next pandemic. And even though COVID is still here, we're still going to have major issues. There's going to be a time where perhaps people need to go and get another booster vaccine. There's going to be a time where people should put on masks in indoor settings, like now. Uh, and with coordinated misinformation and disinformation campaigns, we're completely eroding uh, public trust. That erodes public buy-in, and we see what we're seeing. It's really important to have an all-hands-on-deck approach, a team effort, and include social scientists and behavioral scientists as part of that team uh, and, you know, I, I get it. It's a fine balance between no one's policing social media. We have to, of course, respect freedom of speech, but we just can't have overt lies and false data drive bad decision making. We see the impact and it's terrible. Always a great conversation with you. Thanks for your time today. That is Dr. Isaac Bogosh. Okay. He's an infectious diseases specialist.